Hi, this is Professor Cummings. I wanted to do a video here just going over a little more on integration, but particularly one small section. So hopefully this will be a short video. One small section on integration, which is that whole idea of the area underneath the curve. I know that's, you know, kind of a out of hand definition that everyone gives when they say what is integration, what is an antiderivative, and you get the quick answer of it's the area under a curve. But I really feel like that deserves a bit more of an explanation. So this is what this video is going to focus on, just a bit more of an explanation on that area under the curve, and hopefully it gives you a little bit more intuition as to how that works and how that actually gets you, a, you know, back to your original function or back to another function. So let's start off with a function. Now let's say, you know, it's the velocity versus the time, velocity versus the time and we graph a function over the course of time and that function you know the, or the different data points gives us this particular function we'll call this function f of x you know so we got a function f of x nothing unusual about that now you can look at this function f of x you know velocity versus time and in other videos we showed that velocity is just a derivative of time or velocity is a derivative of displacement my mistake velocity is a derivative of displacement now if we were to put a rectangle underneath this curve you know just throw a random rectangle underneath this curve what we would see is if you took the area of that rectangle you know the height being the velocity so let's just go ahead and you know show that the height here is the change in the velocity so the height is the change in velocity and the width horizontally is the change in time. So if we just, you know, drew a, a rectangle on this graph, we would see this, uh, you know, we have a height, which is, you know, going up along the y-axis and a length that's going along the x-axis. And if we take the area of that rectangle, you know, it's just the length times the height, which is the change in the time versus the change in the velocity. You know, now, if we just think of this as a, a physics problem, you know, velocity times time is, is your distance. So that's the area under the curve is the distance. But you can look at this time, or you look at this rectangle, and you look at the actual function, f of x, and you can see a whole lot of error in this. All right, so you've got space here that is not being accounted for. You've got space here that is being over-accounted for in this, using this rectangle method. You know, so because of this interval of time that we've chosen, we've got a whole lot of inaccuracies here in this in this particular uh, in this particular example. So you know that's the problem with using just one rectangle to try and grab the area under such an irregular curve. So let's try something different. So let's look at this exact same function, exact same axes, and we'll use a smaller interval of time. But we'll use a consistent interval of time, but just a smaller interval of time. So what you end up with is what I've shown is four intervals of time. You know, so an interval one, two, three, and four all have the same changes of time. All have the same delta t, delta time. But when they meet the function, you know, f of x, you know, the height gets different. The height has changed. So what you can do is you can take the interval of each one of these rectangles you know, following this same uh, formula, times times uh, time times the velocity, change in time times the change of velocity for each interval, and you end up with a slightly more accurate version of what that area is. But still, it has still got a lot of inaccuracies in it. So you've got a you know space here that's not accounted for, space here that's not accounted for, and you've got space here that's over accounted for. So you know you've got a still some more inac or too many inaccuracies. So that's more accurate, but still not very accurate at all. So let's look at another one. So take a slightly smaller, again, you got a smaller uh, interval of time, so a smaller delta t. And you can see that as you uh, take each rectangle to a height of f of x to where it meets its actual function, you're getting a little bit more accurate, but you still have some inaccuracy. So you get an inaccuracy, oops, an inaccuracy in here. Now to fix that, inaccuracy there. You know, space that's not being accounted for. Now you've got an area that's pretty close to being accurate, but still you got some overlap and some gaps 
that still haven't been accounted for. So what I'm hoping you're starting to see is that what we have is the sum of all the areas you know of each of these intervals is actually what starts to describe the area of, of underneath that curve you know so if we keep these getting smaller and smaller increments of time you know and you know developing more and more rectangles to meet the function or to raise to a height of that that equi uh, this the equivalent of the function we'll end up with uh, you know a, a slightly more accurate area you know the way to get the area under the curve is to add up all the rectangles now this four, third point here f of the summation of f of x times time you know is still just it's a uh, giving you the area of the square uh, area are the sum of those areas of each one of those rectangles expressing a little more mathematically also what we're looking at with these different rectangles these different delta times is that you're dealing with something that's going to be inaccuracy, inaccurate, a lot of inaccuracies, and the inaccuracies are based on how small of an interval of time we take. Again, all we changed here was making the intervals of time smaller and smaller, starting from here, going to here, and then to here. All of these are just smaller and smaller delta t's. So what do we do if we take this same function, and instead of using a delta t, you know, some interval of delta t, we go to the smallest we can get, we can get the delta t as t approaches zero, the limit of t as uh, time approaches zero, and we use infinitesimally small integrals of time. So what we do is we go from the idea of using delta t to using a differential, infinitesimally small units of time. What we can do is we can write that as dt. And that's probably what you're more familiar with when doing integration. You don't see delta t, you see a dt. It means you're referencing an infinitesimally small unit of time. So these, there will still be rectangles, or you can still think of it as rectangles underneath this curve, all with the same increment of time of delta t. Now, when you have these small infinitesimally, you know, infinitesimally small increments, the height of each one now it becomes the function okay so the height of each one now becomes the function so what happens when you calculate that area you go from adding up the areas you know f of x the height times delta time which gets you your an approximation of your displacement or distance to actually using this formula the area or the distance is equal to the infinite sum or f or infinite sum f of x times this differential of time so the integration of f of x with respect to t or the differential of time so that is how you know I want you to think of you know or get some intuition on the area under the curve which will help you with your integration you're looking at a differential of time or an infinitesimally small amount of time with respect to a height which is your, you know, whatever your function is. And you're looking at, you know, that many, you know, which would be infinite number of, of rectangles. So I hope this helps. This is Professor Cummings. Uh, thanks for watching.